much. Let me share my screen. Um, put this in play mode. So thank you so much, Jay. It's uh, really, really a pleasure to be here and to participate in this phenomenal um, seminar series. Thank you so much for uh, hosting it and initiating this great effort uh, during the past several months. So as some of you may know, uh, our laboratory is interested in understanding the structure and function of large ATP dependent chromatin remodeling complexes. Most notably, the mammalian switch sniff, also called BAF, family of chromatin remodeling complexes. And we place particular emphasis on understanding how perturbation to the individual components of these complexes can play driving uh, or contributing roles uh, in human disease. So our laboratory is largely centered in, in biochemistry, biophysics, uh, increasingly structural biology. And we integrate in uh, epigenomic and, and genome-wide uh, approaches, genomic approaches, uh, as well as systems biology and even machine learning to really take a full constellation of approaches to identify uh, the various you know, ways by which this uh, machine, molecular machine, can be perturbed uh, in disease. And in parallel, I'm fortunate to partner with and participate in groups intensely dedicated toward translating such discoveries into hopefully meaningful therapeutics for patients, which brings me to my disclosure slide. I'm the scientific founder, board of directors member, SAB member, shareholder, and consultant for Fogman Therapeutics, which is a company I started a few years back. And I will not discuss any off-label use or investigational use in this presentation. So I think this group really needs no introduction, but of course the sequencing of the human genome and subsequently cancer genomes has immeasurably advanced our understanding of the molecular underpinnings of human disease. And just a couple of years ago, we actually saw the fruit of a very large scale effort called the Cancer Genome Atlas, TCGA, where in the key paper shown here on the bottom, uh, they, these authors reported the sequencing of over 33 different cancer types and a number of, of course, uh, subtypes within those, over 10,000 tumor samples. And they identified 300 driver genes and over 3,000 putative missense mutations. Uh, it's really quite a remarkable effort and continues to serve as the inspiration for much of what our lab does, and I'm sure this is true for a number of the other groups um, watching this talk, that really human genetics uh, in the context of human cancer have really inspired a, a, a wide range of new studies in the area. This is actually one of my favorite panels from uh, the large uh, series of uh, papers published in Cell Press, where you see here on the x-axis uh, a large number of uh, uh, cancer types, all abbreviated by their TCGA nomenclature. And you can see on the y-axis a number of signaling pathways or processes that are perturbed with the um, color bar representing the frequency of genes in those pathways mutated in any given cancer. So we see mutations, of course, in signaling pathways. These are signaling pathways with components that have been longstanding culprits uh, for various drug discovery efforts both by pharma and academia for many, many years. You see mutations in uh, apoptotic and cell cycle regulators. But perhaps the most surprising and unexpected result to come from all of the sequencing studies was the previously unappreciated idea that chromatin regulatory processes, epigenetic processes, are frequently perturbed. In fact, in fact some of the most frequently perturbed uh, across human cancer. So you see here by the bars I've highlighted, there are mutations in histone modifiers, uh, um, uh, proteins that can create histone modifications, DNA modifiers. The complex I'm going to tell you most about today, uh, the switch NIF complex, it's so frequently mutated, it gets its own row. It's called its own pathway among the various ones shown here. Uh, and of course, we also see mutations in transcription factors, which can leverage various facets of the chromatin landscape to elicit their cell, tissue, and ultimately disease-specific uh, phenotypes. So uh, as I mentioned, you see mutations in uh, genes encoding proteins and protein complexes that uh, render chromatin in this closed conformation largely inaccessible to uh, transcriptional machinery, and thus the genes controlled by these regions of chromatin are held in the off position. And we see mutations that uh, are in proteins that uh, enable the accessibility of DNA, allowing DNA to become open and uh, open for active transcription. So you see these mutations uh, such as DNMT, DNMTs, uh, uh, TET uh, enzymes, for example, DNA modifiers, histone modifiers, hints, histones themselves, so actually mutations in the very uh, octomer itself, histone tails, and for the purpose of this talk, uh, mutations in chromatin remodeling complexes, such as the switch, switch NIF complex. Now, this is just an artistic representation of the mammalian switch NIF complex shown here, drawn approximately to scale with its local nucleosomal environment. <clears throat> These complexes utilize the energy of ATP hydrolysis as its endon. Uh, to essentially mobilize uh, DNA nucleosome contacts, thereby enabling uh, timely and appropriate uh, DNA accessibility throughout our genomes. Uh, these complexes were originally discovered in yeast uh, in screens for mate type switching and sucrose uh, fermentation. Uh, they were later characterized in Drosophila and then ultimately uh, in the mammalian cell context and actually even most recently 
um, by our group in defining um, the various complexes uh, that are contained within this family and finding that there are actually three distinct final forms and working to order how these complexes are pieced together, their assembly modules, et cetera. So on the left, I show you the 29 genes that encode the various members of these complexes, but you can appreciate from the drawing that there aren't 29 subunits, and that's because these subunits are actually pieced together in a combinatorial fashion from the products of those um, 29 genes. So this gives rise to a large number of combinatorial possibilities, even in one given cell. We have multiple types of BAF complexes running around the genome, uh, all comprised of slightly different subunit componentry. So you see that um, uh, there, because of this combinatorial assembly, there are many hundred total possibilities that can, the way that these things can be assembled. Uh, there are three final form complexes, again shown here for simplicity, just one of them, um, with specific subunits that can demarcate each final form. Uh, and there are mutually exclusive paralog subunits, um, for example, two different ATP aces called SMARK A4 and SMARK A2, two different ARID components called ARID 1A, ARID 1B, uh, and so on. So um, the reason that we are so excited about these complexes is indeed their frequent mutations uh, in, in, um, in cancer, as I mentioned on the previous slide. And if we now take a deep dive and look at TCGA, even the most modern uh, updated TCGA, you can see that if we sum the mutation frequencies for each of the subunits across uh, human cancer, this is PANCAN, you can see that the mutations are present in over 20%, around 20% of human cancers. And if we start to now add in, in addition to uh, exon mutations, you start to add in loss of heterozygosity, deep deletions, you can see that this number continues to rise. So here over 24% of human cancers, just the mutations in the exome. And of course there are uh, this is still the tip of the iceberg because exome mutations are just one way to perturb a gene. There are, of course, other mutations throughout uh, the enhancer regions, other intronic regions that can also control the expression of these genes. So this is really a, a major, um, uh, major burden uh, across human cancer. Uh, so one of the uh, reasons I actually am familiar and, and tied to Alex's Lemonade Stand Foundation and one of the reasons I find my home department at Dana-Farber and Harvard Medical School as pediatric oncology is because in a number of rare but genomically well characterized cancer types, uh, for example, those shown here on the, on the x-axis, in a number of those, the mutation in a component of the mammalian switch NIF complex is the hallmark uh, uniform feature, the driving feature, and as you can see, um, near 100% near of cases in many of these uh, types of tumors, for example, synovial sarcoma, which I'm going to tell you about today, um, has this characteristic SS18-SSX uh, fusion protein, which is found universally uh, in essentially 100% of um, uh, tumors, synovial sarcoma tumors. There are a number of other uh, genes that encode for components uh, within the chromatin remodeling complex I'm describing, uh, which are, again, um, uh, exhibit uniform or near uniform uh, driving features in these cancer types. So you can see some of them are recurrent. You can see SMARC-B1 present in malignant rhabdoid tumors, uh, atypical teratoid rhabdoid tumors, which are also pediatric uh, uh, conditions, epithelioid sarcoma, uh, other pediatric chordomas and epithelioid schwannomas also have pretty high frequencies of uh, mutations in this gene. So um, with this, these are a number of rare cancers that really provided strong support for an initiating role, the ability of this complex to play a driving role in the initiation and maintenance of these cancers. And it's uh, many of these that we've uh, essentially used um, to uh, as, as platforms to, for us to better understand the overall structure and function of these complexes. So um, what I've told you is that specific subunits can be mutated in specific cancers, as you see from this bar chart and in the heat map in the previous uh, slide. Other subunits can be mutated across a much more wide range of cancers. Uh, for example, ARG1A is the most frequently mutated subunit uh, within this family of complexes. And of course, if that's mutated in a wide range of cancers and a wide range of tissue types, this suggests some defining commonalities. Intriguingly, uh, some of the most frequently mutated subunits are actually not those that are required for the textbook definition, the canonical definition of these remodelers, which is to remodel chromatin. Essentially, a lot of the assays that we use in this field uh, leverage the ability to take a complex and place it on a chromatinized template and just allow it to do its job to essentially remodel those DNA nucleosome contacts. But it turns out that not all of the subunits are actually required for that function, um, begging us and the, and the rest of the field to really identify new assays that can more faithfully recapitulate mammalian chromatin architecture so that we can really understand uh, what those components are doing. And then finally, some of these mutations can be heterozygous. So this really implicates the importance of gene dosage effects. Uh, throughout cancer and also other diseases. So over the past uh, five years, five, six years or so that I've had my young lab, 
we've essentially walked our way around this complex, if you will, um, essentially focusing mostly on uh, rare pediatric tumors, such as many of the ones shown here, where again, you can see the very frequent percentages um, of, uh, of tumors that have a, a specific uh, perturbation to this complex. So we've done some work on loss of function settings, for example, examining um, uh, the deletion of certain subunits. And this is a characteristic one right here, this might be one deletion, which is deleted in essentially 100% of malignant rhabdoid tumors in a typical teratoid rhabdoid tumors and over 90% of epithelioid sarcomas. Another type of rare ovarian cancer, small cell carcinoma of the ovary, hypercalcemic type, which has as its defining feature, dual loss of both of the ATP cases, so the entire engine of the complex is missing. Uh, we've worked to identify the biochemical modules uh, and structural modules, in fact, a, a 3D structure um, generated using cryo uh, EM, uh, cross linking mass spectrometry, which was just published last week in Cell. Uh, we've worked to define the functional modules as well as the interactions of these complexes with transcription factors. Um, and those trans transcription factors can be those that are overexpressed in disease or even other fusion proteins, which are characteristic of other pediatric malignancies, such as EWS fly1 uh, in Ewing sarcoma. Uh, and these factors tether transiently to the surfaces of these regulators to drag them essentially or hijack them to new sites um, on the genome. So uh, across all of these settings, one of the very unique um, disease contexts that we've uh, studied and actually was my initial uh, foray into chromatin remodeling was um, this synovial sarcoma uh, condition. And this is, um, uh, again, 100% of synovial sarcoma cases have this uh, onc uh, oncogenic chromosomal translocation, which results in this fusion oncoprotein. And by virtue of this fusion oncoprotein, SSX is added on to the SS18 subunit shown here. And we've done a number of work, and I'm going to tell you a new story that emerges from uh, our work on this in the lab. So this actually dates back to some of the work I did as a graduate student while I was in Jerry Crabtree's lab as, um, as a cancer biology graduate student uh, several years ago, where we actually identified SS18 as a novel component of the complex and then tried to examine what happens um, in uh, tumor cells that now have this fusion oncoprotein SS18 SSX which again is driven from this uh, TX18 chromosomal translocation that is pathognomonic for synovial sarcoma. What we found was that this fusion protein uh, usurps these BAF complexes by dominantly integrating into the complex, displacing the residual um, remaining uh, SS18 from the remaining allele, wild type allele, and um, somehow, and it was unknown at the time, displacing, uh, seemingly displacing this subunit called BAF47 or SMARC-B1, uh, the same tumor suppressor subunit that's deleted in malignant rhabdoid tumor from the complex. And the net result of all of this is that we found at the time, back in 2013, that this complex would then target to sites that had some of this K H3K27 trimethylation uh, and would activate genes. In this case, it was still in the era of doing uh, qPCR, so just one that we focused on, SOX2, and that this would support proliferation. Excitingly, we found that we could actually toggle between this oncogenic form of the complex and its wild type counterpart by simply just changing the concentration of either the fusion protein or the wild type SS18. And that would dictate whether the complex had the fusion protein in it, the wild type protein in it, and it would change um, its behavior uh, on chromatin. And it would also um, cause for the cells to either continue proliferating or, um, or quiesce. So uh, what we wanted to do is to understand then what happens if we perturb the levels of the oncogenic fusion. And here you can see on the right-hand side of the slide, just using a shRNA uh, mediated uh, knockdown approach, you can see a very clean deletion of the two bands corresponding to the oncogenic fusion. And this is paired with a concomitant increase in SS18 wild type levels, as well as the BAF47 tumor suppressor subunit, SMARP-B1, uh, shown here, uh, increasing levels when we get rid of this fusion. So this begs the question, how would this oncogenic fusion uh, affect the global targeting uh, all throughout the genome? How does this affect the global targeting of BAF complexes and subsequent gene expression programs that are elicited by its targeting? So to do this, again, we use this uh, SHRNA approach, and you can see here in synovial sarcoma cell lines, in the presence of the knockdown, you can see that complexes measured here by three distinct antibodies um, that, that bind to and tag the complex. You can see that these complexes disappear from a very uh, seemingly cancer-specific set of sites that is only present um, upon the fusion incorporation. So with the fusion being present uh, in these synovial sarcoma cell lines, you can see this top part of these sites are really very specific for the synovial sarcoma setting. And when we release that, when we remove uh, the fusion, you can see the complexes are released to target to a whole set of other sites on the genome. And this was really quite uh, intriguing because it was the only disease setting at the time that we had found where there was such a stark difference between where complexes go on chromatin when the fusion is there and where complexes go when the fusion is not there. 
Um, in many of the other cases, you just, you know, you lose sites in these loss of function tumors. So this was really um, uh, very unique in, in what we were observing here. This could really be moved around. You're just changing the distribution of complexes on chromatin. And you can see that in the reverse experiment on the right as well. If you just take fibroblasts and we now introduce either the wild type protein or the SS18 SSX protein, we can see here that um, the, uh, the complexes marked by SS18 are again dragged to these new set of sites. And this is also paired with increased accessibility at those sites. So we're really changing the chromatin landscape by simply adding this fusion. Um, another interesting thing that we noticed is that these complexes, when we examine where do they go on the genome, that's what I showed you on the, on the past slide, we noted that they were going specifically to regions of chromatin that are supposed to be repressed. They're supposed to be repressed by complexes such as PRC2, polycomb repressive complex 2, that keeps these uh, genomic loci in the off position and, and heavily repressed. So you can see here, um, both measuring um, uh, the, the complex occupancy. So here we're looking on the top panel of each of these, you see wild type SS18, and on the bottom panel, you see this fusion oncoprotein, which forms these very clear, um, uh, very dense localizations. These are actually at inactive X chromosomes in these cells. These are bar bodies, so they're very no known to be very heavily repressed. And you can see the occupancy co-overlap or the localization co-overlap with these uh, members of PRC1 and PRC2 complexes, uh, respectively. And you can see that also on the genome-wide level. What we noticed, um, which was again unique for this uh, cancer setting, was that BAF complexes overlap with PRC2 complexes across the genome. Um, so much so that if we now look at, on the left-hand side, the Venn diagram here in synovial sarcoma cell lines, if you just try to map, where is this repressive complex shown here marked by SUSY12, a component of PRC2, it is overlapping much more strongly uh, with BAF complexes in the control condition. So when we have not knocked down uh, the fusion, but when we knock down the fusion, you can see many of those sites go away. And uh, vice versa in fibroblasts, when we introduce the fusion, you can see much more overlap at these SUSY12 um, marked sites. So this uh, brings us to a key question, asking what would be the mechanism then that would make these complexes go to these very site-specific um, regions of chromatin? Why is it going to these repressed sites? And if it is going to these repressed sites, what is the molecular basis underlying the interaction of this complex with chromatin? What is the actual mechanism by which this can interact with chromatin? We like this question because if we understood this and we could answer this, we could you know, certainly define the specific features of the interaction of the fusion protein with chromatin, but we could also understand cancer-specific synthetic lethal dependencies that have been observed in synovial sarcoma through these larger scale uh, genome scale uh, screening studies. And most importantly, we could inform and design new therapeutic approaches based on these me basic mechanistic findings. So to start, we started with a biochemical approach as we often do in our lab. And we simply purified complexes containing SS18 and SSX and complexes containing wild type SS18. So they are just purifying these BAF complexes uh, using these tag subunits shown here. And we noted something very striking right off the bat when we did that. You can see that when we purify wild type complexes, they come off chromatin very easily. There's very little in the chromatin fraction, which is abbreviated here with CHR. And they're nice and soluble in the nuclear extract. You can pry them off chromatin, no problem. Um, however, when we try to do this same experiment with SS18 SSX, you can see that it was nearly impossible with these experimental conditions to pull off the pull off these complexes from chromatin. And they were so tightly held to chromatin that you are actually observing, you're purifying out the histone octamer. These are members of the nucleosome shown here at almost one-to-one -one stoichiometry. You're actually capturing the complex and the nucleosomes to which it's bound, suggesting that they're bound very tightly um, and very little comes out in the nuclear extract. Uh, if we now run these on, uh, on mass spec experiments to try to quantitate some of those peptides, again, you see that in the context of the SS18 SSX fusion, this is really enriching for members of the BAF complex, as well as many uh, components um, that are encoding for the various histones. So this was quite striking. We then tried to uh, use additional biochemical approaches to see if we were recapitulating this no matter which way we tried it. And indeed here, using uh, 10 to 30 percent glycerol gradients, these are just simple measurements of um, of size of density sedimentation. So heavier proteins will migrate toward the um, right-hand side of the screen, toward the heavier fractions, lighter proteins migrate toward the earlier fractions. Uh, on the top part, I'm showing you a very normal profile of BAF complexes. So you can see they're migrating roughly around thir fractions four 13 and 14. You can nicely label all the components in the complex, but look what is the stark contrast between that and the um, SS18 to SSX1 shown on the bottom. The gradient looks like a mess. The complexes are purified are actually higher in molecular weight. These are the ones that are coming out as full complexes. And they're pulling with it the members of the histone octamer. You can see here members of you know, H3, H4, H2, H2B coming out uh, with these complexes. So suggesting it's very hard to pry 
once the complexes have this SS18 SSX, it's very challenging to pry them away from their nucleosome substrates. Uh, taking another approach yet, uh, differential salt extraction, one can use to try to identify how tightly held are these complexes on chromatin. And again, you can see that they're very challenging to remove from the chromatin pellet, even at a thousand millimolar salt. But the second we start to remove the fusion protein, from these synovial sarcoma cells, you can see that they're released into the more soluble uh, fractions and into the, they can be precipitated at lower, uh, lower millimolar salt. And finally, you can use uh, imaging studies based on FRAP to identify the residency times of these complexes uh, on chromatin. So you can see that the synovial sarcoma uh, associated complexes have much higher residency times. They're sitting on chromatin longer, they're more tightly bound, uh, and they are um, dissociating at a, a lower frequency. So uh, that was all in examining now the entire complex as a whole with or without the fusion protein. So to try to isolate what was going on, we determined that the best strategy to do that would be to remove SSX from the fusion protein itself. So really, since this is the main thing that's added, this SS18 SSX, sorry, this SSX tail onto SS18, let's study that tail in isolation. So just take the 78 amino acids. So we did that and purified uh, the 78 amino acids shown here, just tagged to a GST protein for solubility. And what you can see here is that when we purify this and now subject them to binding studies with, uh, with, with nucleosomes, you can see that the 78 amino acids just by itself is sufficient to pull down histones. It's sufficient, sufficient to actually capture histones, suggesting a binding interaction between SSX itself and chromatin. So this was surprising and previously unknown. We didn't know that SSX would be able itself to um, you know, tether to and engage uh, the histone octamer. So then to try to get a better idea of this, we subjected uh, this, SS18, this uh, GST SSX uh, protein to nucleosomes. This is now mammalian nucleosomes taken from, for example, 293T cells. So they have all the constellation of marks on them. And we're just simply incubating those with the nucleosomes and performing some quantitative targeted mass spec. And what we found here was that indeed, Though the SSX protein, if in incubated with nucleosomes, selectively purifies and captures out nucleosomes that have these repressive marks. So we were capturing nucleosomes um, much more frequently that had these repressive marks than those that had activating marks. And you can see here with an activating mark like acetylation, uh, as you add more and more and more acetylation groups, you see less and less and less and less binding of the, um, uh, of the SSX uh, 78 amino acid tail to the nucleosomes. And this is relative to H4 unmodified where you have nice enrichment of those nucleosomes. So to try to examine what's going on with the 78 amino acids in a bit more detail, we simply perform some alignment studies, um, taking the 78 amino acids and aligning them throughout uh, the SSX family, as well as a related family known as PRD, PRDM7 and PRDM9. And what we noted when we did that is just in this last 34 or so amino acids of the 78 amino acids, there was a basic region and an acidic region. Uh, basic region shown here with a lot of these uh, blue colored amino acids and this acidic region with here a lot of these negatively charged uh, amino acids. Uh, we found that the 34 amino acids uh, are, are sufficient to bind these histones and then proceeded to make mutations throughout this 34 amino acid region to identify where in this 34 amino acid region, what, what are the regions most required to actually bind the nucleosomes, to bind histones. And what we found here is that we made, if we made any perturbation in this basic region, so for example, this lysine here, 168 to an alanine, or simply swapping out all of the alanines for basic amino acids, you could see a complete disappearance in the ability to even bind histones. So it seemed like that basic region is very important for even binding uh, the nucleosome itself. However, if we made any mutations in, this, in the acidic region or even swapped that entire acidic region for alanines, you could see that the binding to histones was still maintained. So this region we didn't uh, yet have an explanation for, for, but this basic region we knew was critical for binding the nucleosomes. So then we zoomed out a little bit to try to understand what happens, what's the result of all of this in cells. So we turned to ChIP-seq approaches to map uh, these complexes on chromatin. You can see here the SS18 SSX protein. Uh, again, I'm showing you that very unique set of sites to which it targets. Um, and this we found by doing these studies that the 34 amino acids itself uh, was also sufficient to target it to these very specific sites on chromatin. However, any mutation, oops, any mutation that we made, uh, 24 amino acids, so not the full complete 34, a deletion of the acidic region, a deletion of the basic region, all of these were insufficient to target the complexes to these specific sites. And actually, as you can see from the heat maps here, they looked very similar to the wild type um, SS18. If we now translate that ChIP-seq and try to examine what happens at the RNA-seq level, you can again see that SS18-SSX or SS18-SSX with the 34 amino acids 
uh, was sufficient to elicit this uh, expression pattern where some genes here are very strongly activated and others are negatively uh, regulated. And you can see that again, any of the perturbations to either the acidic or the basic region um, were unable to elicit that effect. And finally, this carried over into proliferation. We know that these synovial sarcoma cells are dependent on the presence of the fusion protein. So we did uh, perform some rescue experiments to examine um, which types of the fusion were able to rescue uh, these cells in terms of proliferation. You can see that only the full link fusion with the 78 amino acids or this 34 amino acids were able to rescue. And this is compared then to any of the versions of the, uh, of the SSX that didn't have the full 34 amino acids. So they were missing either the acidic or the basic regions. So this basic region I'm showing you disrupts, uh, seems to disrupt nucleosome binding. So what happens on nucleosome targeting? Well, we pursued to make a single residue mutation. Here shown the R169A mutation in that basic region. And again, this is responsible for tethering to, this region is important for tethering to nucleosomes. So if we make this mutation, you break the interaction. And then if we examine what happens on chromatin, just the single point mutation alone is able to break the synovial sarcoma specific signature as to where these complexes go. To get a little bit more of a handle on where on the nucleosome uh, this is actually binding, we teamed up with Tom Muir and his talented postdoc, uh, Hai Dao at Princeton, who had developed a very um, clever technique using photo crosslinking. So you actually take um, uh, reactive diazerine probes that are strategically placed throughout the nucleosome uh, histone octamer, the H2A, particularly the H2A H2B interface. So it's in a way to examine the, uh, the acidic patch. And then incubate your protein of choice. In our case, we incubated SSX. And what we found here was that um, there was striking um, uh, uh, photo crosslinking to H2AE56. And that could be uh, ablated by removing that arginine and turning it into an alanine. And similarly on H2B, the uh, E113 residue, that could also be uh, um, significantly attenuated by either uh, mutating the tryptophan or the arginine in that area of the basic region. Uh, and, and in reciprocal um, studies, we took uh, and purified the 78 amino acids of SSX and then incubated them with either nucleosomes that have wild type composition or nucleosomes that have a problem in the acidic patch itself uh, to see whether or not uh, SSX would be affected in its binding. And indeed, if we take any of these nucleosomes that have a problem somewhere in here in the acidic patch, you can see a dramatic decrease in the ability of this wild type protein to tether um, uh, the SSX protein to tether to the nucleosome. And this was further shown by incubating uh, and, and performing competition experiments with a very well-known nucleosome acidic patch binding protein called the LANA protein. And you can see that this is able to outcompete SSX over inc increasing concentrations. So I showed you that SSX now binds directly to the nucleosome acidic patch. Um, and this was actually an interesting uh, way by which these studies that we had gone going in synovial sarcoma converged with another um, student studies in the lab uh, focused on intellectual disability and focus on the subunit SMARTV1. So in parallel with the studies I'm describing to you here, another student in the lab, Alfredo Valencia, was studying this SMARTV1 subunit. And he was particularly interested in this because in a rare but well-characterized intellectual disability syndrome called coffin seer syndrome, he noted that there was a pileup of mutations, particularly at this C-terminal region, this putative coiled coil region of the SMARTV1 BAF47 subunit. There are nine independent cases, for example, uh, of individuals with intellectual disability that had this deletion of this positively charged lysine and also any other kinds of mutations in here that are again a positively charged residue being swapped out for a different type of residue. Um, and what he found was that this particular region of the of SMARTV1 was actually important for interfacing with the nucleosome. And to put things in context, before the study, there was no knowledge as to all the different components I told you on BAF complexes. There was no knowledge as to which components actually hit the nucleosome. We know the substrate of a BAF complex is the nucleosome, but we had no idea of all the subunits there which ones actually touch the nucleosome with the exception of the ATPase. And so what we found was that this little minimal region, just if you make this region of SMARTP1, this minimal region was sufficient to bind nucleosomes. But if we made any of these disease-associated mutations, these coffin serous associated mutations, you could see here very cleanly that all of these completely inhibited the ability of SMARTP1 to bind the nucleosome. And the net result of all of that was that if you perturb the C-terminal region, there's a decrease in the ability of these complexes to remodel chromatin. So they don't function as well. And that's a disease mechanism um, for intellectual disability that are driven by these mutations. And we had a story on that 
um, that was published last year. Very excitingly, uh, if we now take our, our new structure that was just published last week, um, you can see that there are a number of mutations, not only in intellectual disability, but also in cancer that pile up just single residue mutations. And many of these break this key interface of what we solved as an alpha helix, binding the H2A H2B interface of the nucleosomacytic patch. So this is how the complex grips onto the nucleosomacytic patch. And you can see very frequent mutations in cancer uh, that actually will change this residue from a positive charge to a negative charge or a neutral charge and break the ability of this helix to properly form and engage with its, um, uh, its counterpart here on the nucleosomacytic patch, this very nice uh, negatively charged pocket that's created on both surfaces of the nucleosome. So um, to try to understand how this might uh, interplay with what I've been telling you about synovial sarcoma, because we knew that the SS18 and SSX fusion oncoprotein for the past five years, uh, we and others showed that this um, resulted in the decreased stabilization, uh, stabilization of SMART B1. We wanted to understand maybe this would have an impact, this ability of SSX to bind the acidic patch and SMART B1 to bind the same acidic patch. Would this uh, start to explain why we see the um, uh, apparent ejection of this complex from the, uh, of this subunit from the complex. So what we did is we incubated nucleosomes with a biotinylated uh, SMART B1 that just contains that C-terminal region I was telling you about. And we sought to compete that out with increasing concentrations of SSX. And indeed, as you can see from this gel, uh, over increasing concentrations, even at very low concentrations, uh, SMART B1 can be very quickly uh, uh, outcompeted by SSX. However, the reverse is not true. So if we now incubate nucleosomes with SSX and try to outcompete them dominantly with as much SMART B1 as possible, you can see here on this Western blot uh, that you're unable to do that. So this maybe starts to explain the mechanism of dominance, why the SS18 SSX fusion protein is dominant uh, in these complexes and how this may play a role in the destabilization of SMART B1 on the nucleosome and maybe ultimate destabilization on the complex leading to par partial degradation. So this is what I'm describing again, as I told you in the earlier, in earlier work um, that we had done. Uh, you can see here that the fusion, uh, the fusion protein uh, usurps these complexes and, and causes for the degradation and displacement of BAF47. These were the original observations in our, in our 2013 study on this, where again, you see it's not absent, but uh, severely uh, decreased levels of this BAF47 protein, both on the complexes itself, as well as in the total protein uh, levels. So what happens when this uh, SSX uh, engages the nucleosomacytic patch and, uh, uh, and disrupts this uh, SMART B1 binding interaction with the nucleosomes? The net result is that these complexes can actually still remodel. So they still have an acidic batch binding site at the bottom. They can still remodel. They're remodeling at a little bit of a lower um, remodeling uh, percentage here, remodeling frequency, uh, but it's enough to still elicit changes in DNA accessibility over these sites that are um, normally repressed. So you can see here over SS18 SSX target sites, the accessibility of those sites upon gaining the fusion goes up. And you can see that that is also the case here if we look at these new sites that are targeted uh, on chromatin. So all of this is exciting and shows the um, very strong binding to the nucleosomes, shows this very interesting and cancer specific property uh, that the SSX uh, 78 amino acid confers for BAF complexes that they can bind very, very tightly uh, to nucleosomes via the acidic patch. But the acidic patch doesn't explain still why do these BAF complexes target selectively to repressed regions on chromatin? Why are they going to these PRC2 target sites um, and PRC1 target sites? We don't understand that. And the acidic patch would be insufficient to explain that because, of course, the nucleosome acidic patch is on every nucleosome throughout chromatin. So, what's the basis of the specificity there? So, we turn to take uh, um, to uh, genome scale uh, shRNA and CRISPR screening strategies that we're looking at proliferative fitness. And here we just subjected S the SYO1 synovial sarcoma cell uh, cell line and compared it to uh, this uh, histologic mimic SW982, which does not have the fusion oncoprotein, and look for differences in dependence on various factors. And among the top dependencies uh, in synovial sarcoma were dependencies on uh, ring one, ring one A, ring one B, PCGF3, PCGF5. These are members of the PRC1. Uh, polycomorepressive complex one complex uh, that uh, plays a role in, in, in repression. And so you can see here now also taking Project Drive, another shRNA um, driven effort where you're looking at the various synovial sarcoma cell lines shown here. You can see again that some of the top cell lines that are sensitive to depletion of either Ring1B or PCGF3 are actually uh, these synovial sarcoma cell lines. They're at the very top of the curve and some of these are at the very, very highest um, mark. So to try to examine this further, we sought to examine whether 
uh, SS18SSX fusion protein uh, containing complexes, as well as the uh, mark placed by PRC1 repressive complexes, H2A ubiquitination, would overlap on the genome. And you can see here from the ChIP-seq studies that indeed, really, the H2A ubiquitination, the enrichment there is very much over the sites of, uh, of SS18SSX1 uh, over the genome. You can examine this a little bit further by zooming in on a certain locus. So here's the slit 3 locus, for example. And you can see that in the context of the fusion oncoprotein, so when we have not knocked it down in these synovial sarcoma cells, this very nicely overlaps with H2A ubiquitination, the mark that's placed by ring 1 uh, A and ring 1B of PRC1 and PRC1 itself, marked here by ring 1B. We then turn to the structure of PRC1. Uh, from Song Tan's group, uh, where we were able to then use the structure to inform uh, mutagenesis approaches to break various uh, functions of PRC1. Particularly, we wanted to break the function of the complex in placing the H2A ubiquitination repressive mark. And to examine then what happens if that repressive mark is no longer on chromatin, are these SS18 SSX bound complexes still targeted to the sites? And what you can appreciate from the immunofluorescence shown on the right is that when we made these mutations, for example, compared to the wild type, when we made this mutation of Ring1B, this R91E, or this dual mutation, I53A, D56K, you can see that the localization of SS18 SSX is no longer co-localizing with these uh, regions of, uh, of repression shown and marked by Ring1B. Um, so even when they had Ring1B complex localizing, you can see there's no longer the ability of that complex to localize. So it's uh, uh, of the synovial sarcoma containing, uh, SS18 SSX containing BAF complex to localize to these sites. So when the histone mark is no longer present, but the complex is still present, it can no longer go to those sites of repression. So this begs the question, of course, what region of that uh, 78 amino acids is actually mediating this clear preference it has for these sites of H2A ubiquitination? So to that, we and we uh, purified a now GST uh, tagged uh, SSX1, so 78 amino acids, and just now incubated the 78 amino acids of SSX1 with either wild type nucleosomes or nucleosomes that have this repressive mark on them. So the H2A lysine 119 ubiquitination. Uh, and you can see here a very clear preference when we try to incubate the 78 amino acids with regular nucleosomes or nucleosomes that have this histone mark, you can see very clear preference for the nucleosomes that have this H2A ubiquitination perhaps starting to explain why there's a preference and overall skewing of these complexes to these repressed sites. And if we examine the sequence a little bit, again, in detail, as I showed you before, we know that this basic region I showed you is important for binding the nucleosome altogether. It actually engages the acidic patch, but we didn't know what this acidic region did. Um, we knew it was important on in cells for the targeting of complexes, but we didn't know biochemically what it might be doing. So to try to examine whether this last uh, seven amino acids or so were actually responsible for this preference to H2A ubiquitinated nucleosomes, we created a, a, a variant of this where we mutated all of these to alanines. And what you can see here is if we compare now wild type, SS8, uh, wild type SSX compared to SSX with the mutated uh, acidic region, you can see that this relieves the preference. Uh, the, the, the preference for H2A ubiquitinated nucleosomes. So in the wild type, they again prefer in this experiment, they prefer the H2A ubiquitinated nucleosomes. However, uh, upon removal of that acidic region, you can see they no longer prefer those regions. So something about this acidic region here in this determinus is required for the preference um, to go toward uh, H2A ubiquitinated nucleosomes. So as a model for the story I've shown you, uh, what we see here is that by virtue of this chromosomal translocation, SS18 wild type, which is normally a member of BAF complexes, turns into SS18 SSX. This SS18 SSX uh, fusion protein then binds into the complexes, particularly by the ATPase module. It disrupts the core, particularly the core that contains the SMART B1 or BAF47 subunit. And this, the core disruption is mediated by the fact that this SSX anchor is now binding aberrantly to the acidic patch in place of the normal acidic patch binding element from the core, which is the smart b one C terminus, as I showed you. And so with that, I'll thank the members of the lab that did the work. This was led by a very talented graduate student, uh, Matt McBride, who is now a postdoc at Princeton and a uh, postdoc in the lab, Nazar Moshtalir. Um, these uh, two worked very uh, well together to uh, derive this mechanism. Uh, they were aided by uh, computationally by Drew DeVino in the lab, 
Martin Filipowski and Evan Winter, and we're very grateful to our collaborators uh, in Tom uh, Muir's lab, particularly Hai Dao, for the development of this photo cross-linking approach, which was really useful for us in identifying the interaction of the SSX uh, tail with the uh, nucleosomacytic patch and all of the um, uh, all of my uh, funding sources. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much. Wow. Sorry, I couldn't get unmuted on there. Um, we have a couple questions that have already come in. There'll probably be some more as we answer these. Um, thank you for the great talk. So the first question um, we have is, um, for the combinatorial assembly, are there requisite components that are always present in the final complex? If there are, are these, oop, I just lost the end of it. Are, are, there, are these more conserved or less subject to mutations? Ah, that's a great question. So there are uh, complex components that are present in every one of the assemblies, and they must be there um, for the entire complex to form. So in, a, in our uh, 2018 um, uh, cell paper that we had worked out the order of assembly and the modular organization, one of the interesting findings to emerge from that was that there's actually a homo or header or dimer that forms and that's the platform for the entire complex to be formed and, and to be put together. And so what we can see there is that there are SMARC-C1 and SMARC-D1 subunits um, that are present there in that early core of the complex and yet you need that core uh, to be able to um, to be able to form the complex. So yes, you actually are absolutely correct that mutations in that core are far less frequent because they would be all too deleterious. In fact, what we found is that there are more mutations as you go through and progress through assembly, the mutations tend to skew at later parts of the assembly pathway. Because if they occurred too early, all the complexes would be wiped out. It's all too deleterious for the cell. It's a great question. Thank you. Um, next question is, what is the subcellular localization of either SS18 or SSX alone? So SS18, SS, SS18 itself is a member of the BAF complex or switching a family of chromatin modulars. So all, those are always nuclear. So SS18 is always nuclear. Um, SSX, it, when it's fused to SS18 by virtue of the fusion oncoprotein is also, also nuclear. It's not present in the cytosol. All these are nuclear. SSX itself is actually a testy specific protein. Um, so it's normally never expressed in any of our adult tissues with the exception of testes and as, with low levels in the thyroid. So this is a very aberrant, um, uh, this, this really creates for the aberrant fusion protein. This is a, 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 um, a protein that is no, that's not supposed to be expressed in any of our adult tissues. And so its localization is also nuclear. Okay. Uh, next question. Acidic patch binding is attenuated, not eliminated by mutating away the acidic residues. Can Dr. Kadosh comment further on this? And would we expect any retention of functionality? Yeah, it's a great question. So there... The binding, the ability of SSX to bind the nucleosome is completely um, dictated by the acidic patch. It does engage the acidic patch. So if we do break the, for example, the um, one of the arginines there in that region, you do see a complete loss of the ability to bind to the nucleosomes. If you make these single residue mutations, you can see that they fall off nucleosomes altogether. And that's because you're disrupting the positive charge that's required to engage that negative charge. So um, in most of our experiments, I believe this was a near complete um, uh, removal of the binding interaction between that and the acidic patch. You can imagine certain point mutations may partially stabilize or mostly destabilize, but you know, this just depends on which mutation we make within the acidic region. Thank you. Um, next question is how accessible are PRC1 sites still bearing H2 AUB119 bound by SS18 SSX BAF compared to non PRC1 uh, SS18 SSX BAF sites? How accessible are they? So they are the H2A uh, mark sites over which these BAF complexes localize are more accessible than the H2A. Um, just by, uh, by itself, the H2A um, uh, ubiquitinated sites that are alone without BAF complexes. It's a little hard to uh, discern that because again, these complexes are dynamic. So you see a lot of on off rates, but if you look at the pile up of complexes with the, containing the fusion over the H2A ubiquitinated sites, the majority of those sites where the fusion is present are more open than those that are not. It's a good way of doing the analysis, I like it. Next question asks if you're able to comment on the upcoming structural study and what resolution was the structure? 
Oh, on this structural study. So our structural study is actually at lower resolution. And the reason for that was because we took a combined approach and actually purified these complexes out of cells uh, endogenously. So this is the first structure of an endogenous uh, human BAF complex. This was um, uh, taking purified complexes from cells. And so keeping and, and trying to keep the cell, the complex in its, um, and in its uh, native form uh, with and without binding to a nucleosome. So the resolution was uh, more poor, but we were able to combine that with um, homology modeling for yeast structures and also individual components to achieve the resolution that we achieved. So the next question is, why is the SSX fusion so specific to synovial sarcoma? And then part two, does the H2A119KUB uh, dependence suggests that PRC1 landscapes in the cell of origin mediate the context specificity. And then also, <laughs> you, want, you want me to get, you want to do those two first? Sure, I'll take those two. So that, that's a great okay. question. And, um, and up, you're right on. We absolutely think that the PRC1 landscape will play a role in making a cell permissive or not permissive of this fusion oncoprotein. Of course, a huge question in the sarcoma fields in general are just cell of origin. It's a majorly uh, important area. Uh, one that our lab doesn't focus on too much, but a lot of uh, labs throughout the, the world are, are, are focused very heavily on this. You know, it clearly suggests that there must be a very specific cell of origin that is uniquely permissive uh, of the fusion event, because it's quite possible that this fusion event happens in other cells, but it's not selected for. And that can actually be seen in the lab, because if we take the fusion oncoprotein and put it in certain types of fibroblasts, the fibroblasts die. In fact, you can use senescence assays to actually measure the impact of the fusion protein. But if you take just a different kind of set of lines or, you, you know, you can increase the proliferation rate by four to eight X. So it just depends on the context. And so the actual feature that is most dominant in determining whether or not the cell is permissive of the fusion protein um, and it will lead to proliferation or not remains to be determined. And it's a great question. Okay. And then the third part of that question is, would this mean EZH2 inhibitors are ineffective in synovial sarcoma? Yes, it does. That's a great question as well. And actually, they were tried. Unfortunately, they were tried um, for um, synovial sarcoma. What our mechanism argues is that, you know, in, in contrast to malignant rhabdoid tumor or ATRT, where the, you know, these mutations affect BAF complexes and they're no longer uh, able to function. For example, you miss the entire SMRP1 subunit. These complexes are essentially um, shot and they're unable to, to function. That's an example where EZH2 inhibitors may have utility. Um, and in fact, that's exactly where the EZH2 inhibitors have shown some utility. However, in this case, this is a gain of function mechanism. If anything, the last thing you want to do is further inhibit polycomb because what you're doing is dragging, this SSX is dragging complexes to displace the residual polycomb that's there. You're just removing the remaining uh, um, uh, repression over those mm -hmm. sites. And so that's one of the reasons why we think uh, these complex, uh, sorry, these inhibitors have been uh, unsuccessful in this gain of function setting of synovial sarcoma. Well, that was our last question. So I just want to thank you again for, for all that you do and giving us this talk and giving us your time today. And most importantly, I want to thank you, Jay, and the entire ALSF for supporting our research for many, many years now. In fact, this was my very first award um, that I ever was able to uh, receive upon starting my lab. In fact, it was actually uh, before I even moved across the country to start the lab. So I'm very grateful for uh, the support of the ALSF and most recently the support through the A Award. This has meant a great deal to our research program and continues to propel forward very exciting discoveries in this area, not only for synovial sarcoma, but for many other fusion oncoproteins. So thank you. Thank you. And then we can say we knew you when. <laughs> thank you so much for the opportunity. Have a great day, All right. everybody. I right, appreciate it and take care. Bye-bye.